Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on implementing archive space in a remote work environment. I'm Jessica Crouch, the Community Engagement Coordinator for Archive Space, and I'm joined today by Tamara Taylor, Amanda Boxar, and Anna Timkina of University of South Florida Libraries Tampa Special Collections. In this webinar, tomorrow, Amanda and Anna will illustrate how they structured their complete migration to archive space in a remote environment, including the active incorporation of student workers with various levels of archival experience. No one on staff had prior experience with archive space, and all members of the team were trained in stages. They'll also address how this project encouraged a more holistic reassessment, including systematically evaluating finding aids for missing information, conscious editing of descriptive content and subject headings, and the addition of classification headers. This webinar was originally scheduled in July, but was rescheduled due to Tropical Storm Elsa. So I'd like to give a big thank you to Tamara, Amanda, and Anna for their flexibility in this and in rescheduling. I'm so glad we're finally able to make this happen. As I mentioned, your presenters today are Tamara Taylor, Amanda Boxar, and Anna Timkina. Tamara is the head of special collections at the University of South Florida Libraries Tampa campus. A certified archivist, Tamara has nearly 20 years of experience implementing policies, procedures, guidelines, and best practices in the archival field. She currently serves as president of the Academy of Certified Archivists and co-manager of the Society of American Archivists Digital Archive Specialist Exam. Amanda is the Special Collections Operations Manager at the University of South Florida Libraries Tampa campus. Amanda holds a PhD in history with over 12 years of experience in higher education and joined the library in 2019. She was responsible for the migration to archive space and supervised student and employee training through the process. Anna is a student assistant at USF Libraries Tampa campus Special Collections. She received her bachelor's degree in library and information science with in the children's literature track from St. Petersburg State University of Culture and Art in Russia. At USF, she is doing her MA in Applied Anthropology and will soon graduate to continue her academic path at the University of Kentucky. Library work remains one of her great passions. And I think Anna may have graduated between uh, the original scheduling of this webinar and now. We will hold all questions until the Q&A at the end. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen not the chat feature. Questions will be read and answered during the allocated time for Q&A. If you have a general question or if you need some form of assistance or if you just want to talk to your fellow attendees, please feel free to reach out in the chat. And with that, I'll turn things over to your presenters. Tomorrow, if you'd like to start us off. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you everyone for joining us today for our presentation. As Jessica mentioned, my name is Tamara Taylor and I am the Director of Special Collections at the University of South Florida's Library, South Florida Library's Tampa campus. I joined Special Collections in 2003, and since that time, have been directly and indirectly involved in the department through my work as an archivist and librarian at USF. My professional timeline is also the timeline for the Tampa campus's adoption of standardized archival description. So as part of my presentation, I will not only describe my role in these practices, but also present an overview of Special Collections technological infrastructure as related to archives and as it led to our adoption and implementation of archive space. Do you remember the binders full of women from the 2012 US presidential campaign? Well, some 10 years earlier, Special Collections had binders full of finding aids huge black binders with printed collection guides that may or may not have corresponded with electronic files shared across the department. The binders were cumbersome and unwieldy, but provided the best possible access to collections and their contents that we, will, we were able to share with patrons and each other. At that time, our archival collections were not cataloged and our web presence was somewhat clunky. So unless someone visited our reading room or spoke with a knowledgeable member of the special collections team, using our collections to conduct research was both difficult and dated. As a nascent archivist, my primary contributions to special collections centered on archival arrangement and description. Through working with my in-house mentor, attending conferences and workshops, and eventually attending the Western Archives Institute, that's Gail Penner, my, uh, my mentor. Our slides seem to be running a little bit slow, so just bear with us as we deal with our technological issues. Um, so after all of those things, I realized that our descriptive practices were somewhat hit or miss. 
While some librarians excelled at drafting long and laborious biographies and scope notes or detailed container inventories, we often neglected to include information about a collection's provenance or its extent, or such information was relayed in inconsistent ways. In short, our finding aids pose significant barriers to access, both physically and intellectually. Now, this was not terribly uncommon at the time, but USF had some catching up to do, and we attempted to do that through the adoption of basic archival description in 2005 as you can see from my activities report that year. I'll give you a moment to just glance over the text there, um, which basically says that, um, you know, I was tasked with helping us find ways to implement EAD. The next year in 2006, a friend and colleague of mine from the University of Florida traveled to USF to conduct an on-site workshop for Note Tab Light. The workshop was for all special collections staff, not just those of us working with archives, but everyone from the director to the systems administrator. I tried to find a note tab graphic from that era for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the software and its functionality, but the best I could do were a couple of articles in a Library of Congress listserv discussion between Chris Prom and Amy Cooper Carey dated 2001. So you can see that at this point, Special Collections was already a few years behind implementation of both EAD and the technological infrastructure needed to support EAD. As you can imagine, NoteTab didn't stick. In addition to staff finding it difficult to navigate, other factors also led to its early demise in our department. Fortunately, our adoption of basic archival description standards which I formalized through the creation of a standardized template based on the EAD cookbook, the APPM, and DAX stuck. The template provided for basic and consistent descriptive information across all newly processed collections, with a long-term goal of reconciling previously completed finding aids in this new format. This proved very easy and very popular in special collections especially among established staff members who were extremely familiar with our collections, but less familiar with consistent descriptive standards. Although we transitioned into the standardized template with relative ease, it took nearly two years after NoteTab to settle into a software. But with the help of a graduate level intern from the USF School of Information, Special Collections smoothly transitioned into Archon, which we used for nearly 12 years well past its prime and definitely past its in-house life expectancy. The biggest issue we had with Archon was not its utility, but its management. Special collections personnel, from students to faculty, had limited difficulty adapting to Archon. The intern and I created a base, basic manual for reference, and I conducted training at all levels of staffing to ensure consistent use of the system. Thanks to the intern's excellent work and the Finding Eight template I previously created, the transition was fairly smooth. By the end of April 2008, Special Collections had 26, or roughly 8%, of Finding Aids in Archon. That number continued to grow exponentially over subsequent years, resulting in approximately 500 guides by the time we moved to archive space. Our difficulty rested in our own inability to manage the Archon platform. At the time of implementation, the library system administrator fell under the supervision of the special collections director, but was also tasked with numerous other web-based projects and initiatives for the library. With attention focused elsewhere and with a penchant for jailbreaking open source platforms, the system's admin both focused too little and too much on Archon. Thus, issues we encountered and updates we required were not always addressed in a timely manner. As the platform aged and as our staffing shifted, we recognized an opportunity to move in a different direction. Interestingly, library administration may have recognized the need before special collections. As a now former dean asked two special collections colleagues and I, so at that time, I was at another library on campus. I was not in special collections. I returned in 2018. So the Dean asked us to consider moving from Archon to archive space some six years prior to special collections actual implementation in 2020. 
My colleagues and I were reluctant to move special collections from one locally hosted open source platform to another, given internal support issues, and we were uncertain about the library's willingness and ability to pay for a hosted solution. At that time, we agreed we would stick with Archon, and we held firm until a new organizational structure was in place and the libraries had identified a stable funding source to support a hosted solution. In 2019, Amanda, who will be speaking to you next, joined Special Collections with a near singular task of moving Special Collections into archive space. While this would not be Amanda's only responsibility as Special Collections Operations Manager, it was made clear during the interview process that it would be the most immediate and most important. So now Amanda will describe Special Collections successful transition from Archon to archive space. Thank you. Amanda? Thank you, Tamara. Um, and thank you to Jessica for helping us organize our panel and bearing with us through a tropical storm and rescheduling for us to come in a little bit later. As Tamara mentioned, um, my position was absolutely tied around archive space. And while I had had a lot of experience working with different archival platforms as a user, I hadn't worked on the back end. And for some of my process at the beginning of learning how archive space worked and learning a little bit of Archon in the first few months of my position, it ended up working out very well that I wasn't as invested in Archon as some other members of the team because I was able to go into it as a almost a blank slate and able to adapt to those changes um, in ways that made it pretty easy to train others on how to use it. So. For um, our preparation, we definitely prioritized proofreading um, when possible. There was not a public user interface in our Archon version. And so that was going to be something that we wanted to make sure showed up very clearly when we made the change. Um, so we went through and we did some backend proofreading. We also wanted to ensure that all of our Archon finding aids had been fully published in order to migrate properly. The way that our systems administrator had structured our previous system, we had to mark Archon records ready to be published that would then be sent through a third system um, in our digital collections where users could access them. And we wanted to make sure that that could be um, as cleanly accessed as possible. We opted in our preparations to go for a quick prep and a long cleaning method. You should do what works best for your institution. If your institution has the time and the means and the current system to do a longer term prep to handle potential uh, issues that might happen, then you should absolutely go for a longer term prep. For us, our instance of Archon was very slow and definitely struggling and it was taking a long time for our updated finding aids to be accessible to the public. So with that in mind, my goal was to get the migration done as quickly as we could. And it took us about two weeks to prep what we wanted to prep. And then we engaged in a longer cleaning method. For me, part of this was determined by us being remote. We didn't have the ability to go through collections physically and address where they were. This was at the very beginning of COVID from March um, into May. And we started the conversations in March with uh, Lyricist to get things moving for our hosted instance. As we finally prepped for the final migration, we were ready for that. Um, administration was ready for that in May. And so we did our cleaning in about two weeks. Um, we didn't have access to the building at that point, other than one person at a time with a three day gap between people. We were being extremely cautious about access to collections, to surface contact. We weren't sure exactly how COVID was being spread. And so we made sure that we were very careful. So with that in mind, we thought, well, let's just get it moved and we'll clean up what we need to afterwards. I also spent a lot of time talking with other institutions and how they went through their process. And even the institutions who spent a year prepping for the move still spent a year cleaning after. So I think for everyone, it's just, you have to find what works for your institution, what you're comfortable with. There will be changes to your paradigm of what you think 
the system should look like when you move over and there will be new opportunities that you didn't even know were possible. So there's always something new and, and fun to do. We really embraced the shared spreadsheet. We use Box at USF, um, but depending on what your institution uses, whether it's Google or Dropbox, any way that you can have shared spreadsheets is helpful. We assigned out different proofreading tasks um, and marked when things were to be ceased in terms of work and who was assigned to each element. And that was really helpful for us to keep track of when everything was done and ready to be uploaded. In the process of the migration itself, while the technical side was being done, I spent as much time as I could just learning while I was doing it. I attended a lot of webinars and YouTube channels. Um, I attended as many archive space teaching webinars as I could. Um, the introduction to archive space online workshop was launched last April because of COVID and that ended up working really well for us because we weren't able to host in a live session. I took advantage of archive spaces Con confluence page that has all of their training material when you are hosted with archive space um, their full manuals all their training videos. And I made sure that we kept all of this information in a shared file for the department, so I wasn't the keeper of all knowledge, but I had the ability to go through I watched every training multiple times. Um, in some cases, if it was something that was, was new or tricky for me. Um, a lot of it was really straightforward and I just made sure my team had access to it if they needed to go back. I worked with other institutions I talked. Um, with my colleagues at FSU and I emailed with some other groups to just kind of see what they were doing. And I was also able to uh, acquire a couple of different institutional guides um, for how they set up their archive space instances. So between all of those online resources and some networking, I was able to learn quite a bit about how the system worked before we were even fully live, before um, I had to start training my staff. Um, while you can take advantage of all of archive spaces like learning opportunities and, and in person and online trainings um, we found that we were able to take advantage of what had already been published online and then work with our um, our liaisons at lyricists as well to help us push through everything we needed um, in a pretty short amount of time so i felt that i was ready to start training my team um, in September, we wanted to wait till the semester was kind of kicked off and everything was smoothed over. We had a lot of our team who took some summer vacation and um, just to take some time off in the midst of 2020. I think we all needed it. Uh, we had some students who took a break over the summer as well and were coming back for fall. So I opted to basically take from July through September as a bit of a sandbox time for myself. Um, and I started doing some back end work just to get used to the system. Um, but this could be accelerated if your team wanted it to be. We spent six weeks for faculty live training. And it was done during our department meetings so that we didn't have to schedule extra meetings because we all have, I feel like every week I get like an extra standing meeting added to my calendar. So rather than doing that to everyone, we took time out of each of the our live um, department meetings, and I was able to break apart what I had learned in the other trainings into like small digestible chunks. And we had a few weeks where people were able to log in, test their instance, test their user accounts, um, go over different elements of the, of the training um, that needed to be done. And we started assigning different projects to people as we went forward. So we had some new collections coming in. So we created some new uh, accession records and spawned some resource records. I learned very quickly that one of the biggest hurdles for the team was the language difference between Archon and Archive Space. Um, most of you are probably familiar, but Archive Space's language is a lot more similar to Archivist Toolkit than it is to Archon. And because we were still on a 2009 instance of, of Archon, the language is a little bit different. So introducing things like instances, top containers, uh, resource records, we just had to re kind of link what those words meant to us um, in our own understanding. It's all the same thing we had been working with previously. We just had to get the new terms um, set out. So that was something I worked with um, the team to kind of set out a glossary at the beginning of our training guide. 
for my training documents, I started writing this early on. So we'd have an internal instance with examples that took from our um, version of archive space. When working up training documents, you know, I linked as much as I could back to the Confluence and to Archive Spaces trainings, but I also did screenshots from our own and from collections we'd be familiar with in our unique way that we sometimes have series for some collections and don't have series for others and how that's going to look. And living documents are completely fine. I, I update this regularly. I'm probably adding one to two new issues a month still, um, sometimes more than that. I'm training right now five new students. And every time I open up archive space with them, they ask me a really great question. And I'm like, oh, that's a really good point. We can add that to the training guide. So that way it's something that we understand going forward. I reached out and talked with people at partner institutions to see how they set up their training manuals. Um, and many of them were generous enough to share them with us. And so a lot of them have very similar structures. Um, and just tailoring it to your own institution is really helpful for your team to see something that has your name and your branding on it while they work through it. And I always uh, remind the team to check these documents for support, both the document with all of the published training from elsewhere and the one that we have internally. Often we can find it there and if it's not there, then we can add it to it. So that way it continues to be a living document and it doesn't go stale after that first round of training. Once we got through the initial training and we all kind of learned those first hurdles um, and figured out how the system worked and we were all extremely thrilled with the system. Um, like tomorrow said, our Archon instance was, was very old by that point. And so switching to archive space was just a breath of fresh air for, for us here at USF. And we wanted to go through and do a lot of cleaning. And this is where we determined that we were home. Um, most of us were home for four to five days a week. Um, we only started adding a few extra days last uh, spring, probably, and into the summer, um, but we're still hybrid, and so this becomes a really great work from home project. So we're kind of going through this circle of learning, teaching each other, revising what we've learned and how we're going to use the instance, um, coming up with new solutions and cleaning up records. And so we broke our workflow down into uh, six phases and we're still working through them. Um, we're still working on phases four through six. Phase one was just checking for basic kind of migration or general errors. And we knew a few of these when we came into um, the transition. Uh, for example, I knew that we were gonna have an issue with our locations because our locations in Archon were listed as kind of generally written out um, section to section, beginning to end of where the extent of that collection lived on the shelf. And in archive space, it's a different paradigm. You can apply a specific shelf location to every box. Um, you could do it in batches, so it's not that difficult, but it meant that every collection we migrated had an instance associated with it where the location was just incorrect. So that's just something that we were able to go down the list of everything, pull things out, and then we're slowly re-adding those locations over time. So stuff like that that we knew were known errors, we were able to fix. Um, another one was that we had some dummy dates. Dummy dates were not required in our instance of Archon. They are required in archive space. So we were able to go through and fix some of those dates over time. We checked for our unpublished records. We made everything publish um, at the end of Archon so that it would migrate, which meant that we published a lot of records that we had as holding records in the back or just space holders for our shelf guide. We had a shelf guide that was created through our Archon instance previously. So that was something we had to migrate as well. Um, and that meant that everything was kind of live when we did the migration. Um, and we did that on purpose. We went through after the migration was done and we were able to recheck every single collection and just make sure that we wanted them live. We have a modest um, kind of a, let's say we're like a moderately sized archive. We have 500 archival rec or archival collections. It was like, it's like 550 and 516 of those are published. So it's not an unmanageable amount to do that for. If you're a massive archival institution, you might want to adopt, again, a different strategy for your migration, but it completely comes down to the size of your team, the size of your archive, um, and what you have the capacity to work through. That was just a decision that we had made um, to get us out of Archon and into archive space as quickly as possible. For 
the third phase, we started going through and fixing some qualitative information. <clears throat> so this was, again, a decision that wasn't necessarily tied to archive space in any way. But as we were going through the records, we had also adopted kind of a conscious editing initiative within our department. And we decided to do a complete kind of just a, a look, to take a look at every, every single collection um, kind of systematically. And we broke this up between the four members of our staff and many of our students. And so we had a lot of different people going through the records to check them out. So it didn't, it wasn't too onerous on any one person. Um, and it gave us all a chance to kind of revisit the collections that we were most familiar with. So our Florida archivist, he was able to go through and look through all the Florida collections again. Our coordinator of L our LGBT collections, she was able to go through and kind of verify that the language was the way it should be for those collections going forward. And it just gave us an opportunity to work through these records a lot faster in archive space than we could in Archon because of its laggy and bugginess that was happening. So for us, it became just the perfect opportunity to do this as a remote project um, that also facilitated kind of a, a public relaunch where we were able to say like, here's our new and improved finding aid resource that we have available for everyone. As we go forward, um, we're working on adding in all of those locations. We've been doing a large shifting project over the course of the year because it's a good time to do a lot of shifting when you don't have a lot of patrons. Um, and so we're going to applying all those be applying all of those locations. We're going to be relinking to our catalog uh, because the state of Florida switched um, catalog services and everyone's over to Alma. So we're going to be relinking between Archive Space and Alma. So that's another future project for the instance. And then we'll do kind of a, just a final quick check, which will be directed by students who will go through and uh, monitor and check that all of the collections look right at the end. And so at that point, we'll be able to say that we're done, but I don't think we're really, no one's ever really done. Right? In practice, uh, it became really a mix of understanding our existing issues, migration changes just from the paradigm of Archon into archive space, and then new discoveries of things that we wanted to fix. So an example of one of our spreadsheets um, looks like this. So we would check off and put an X if the, these things were missing. Um, so that was a student project. Um, you can see that the items in green were checked by Anna already. Anna is also the one who went through and marked the Xs. So she would go through the collection and check it and see, did it have a date that was missing or a dummy date? Was it missing the scope note, the abstract note, the bio note, and just see what wasn't there. And then kind of more technical level stuff, she would check all of those as well. This was the project that Anna entirely handled was checking these kind of technical fixes on the right side. And then the items on the left side, which were more qualitative, we handed over to the collection experts um, and they were able to go through and work through abstracts and scopes and, and that kind of stuff. So we were able to split up the work in a way that was equitable between the students and the faculty and staff so that everyone, um, was able to participate without being overloaded and using the shared spreadsheets um, was the easiest way for us to do that on our side. For student training, um, I did chunk them out a bit more. So rather than six weeks, it was 10 weeks. Um, and we took extra time uh, when we needed to. So we took two weeks um, to learn about fixing collection errors and doing cleanup. Um, where we only had one week for cleanup for the other side, but because the students handled a lot of the kind of technical cleanup stuff that were like just small, just issues that arose because of the differences between the way that Archon and Archive Space ran, the students handled a lot of that. So we spent more time on that with them. I started everybody with this really broad introduction, and then we went down to task specific training. So if they did not need to know a lot of these details, they didn't get that. So the first wave of students uh, I had three students who were really actively involved. The majority of their time was spent on archive space while they were working remote. And we had the we had the luxury and the privilege of keeping four to five students at a time while we were working remote, um, which I recognize not everyone was able to do or is able to do. Um, and then we had another group who was there for kind of secondary cleanup or was processing new collections directly into archive space. And so their, their training was a little bit um, shorter than the first groups. The other thing I would say about student training is just be ready for lots of questions. Um, and that's true of faculty and staff training too. 
um, and be ready to learn together. There were often times where I just couldn't figure out the simplest of things. It just like wasn't clicking. Um, and Anna would be like, well, it's, it's this, uh, you know? And so me and Anna were able to work together on a lot of those issues um, and solve a lot of problems together. And Anna will talk a little bit about kind of our process of communication later, but it was really beneficial um, to be able to work with her and go through problems one by one. And once we worked through an issue together, once we were able to show others and it was able to snowball um, going forward. So in terms of our lessons learned, document everything. Uh, one thing I really regret is we did not record our training sessions for, for faculty and staff, which meant that the days that we had faculty and staff who were absent, um, I had to go back and do one-on-one -on -one sessions with them, which I didn't mind because I actually get really excited talking about archive space with everybody um, and the meetings end up running way long, but it would have probably saved us all a bit of time had I recorded those trainings. Uh, take screenshots as you work through stuff and, and write down what you're working on. That's why I said those training guides can be a living document. Everybody that I work with knows they're living documents. And if you find an incomplete sentence, that's fine because I'm probably working on it that day. Um, so just kind of keeping track as I go through. I'd say to give yourself enough time to learn as well. I gave myself that time over the summer and I'm really glad that I did. I think I would have spent a lot of, I would have had a lot of extra hassle had I rushed myself into instantly trying to train the team without spending a couple of weeks myself just working through what I needed to know. Um, and that again was just a privilege we had of working from home and I had the time to go through that because our Archon instance was internally hosted and not on a timeline to get shut down. I know some schools do have that timeline once they make the migration. Um, and I would say you can start automating your training going forward. If you record the sessions, if you keep track in spreadsheets, you can kind of lay that out for everyone. So for me, um, these were the big things that I kind of learned and took, took away from, from this process of training a mixture of staff and students over the course of, of two months in the fall of last year. But the, the show goes on for us. Um, we still have more cleaning. I have about a 12 month goal um on adjusting our levels um our box naming conventions the records and controlled vocabulary and doing some more conscious editing work as we finish up the last of those spreadsheets we've made a lot of progress in the last month since uh, the slide was originally drafted but we're still working on each of these areas i have an 18 month goal to finish all the physical locations this one's a little longer because we are still finishing up some shifts this fall and once everything is finalized and shifted, we'll be able to add in all the physical locations. And that will be a project that I will have a student working on. Uh, once I am able to get everything set in the back stacks, I will have a student who will apply all the physical locations for me. And then for digital objects, we have a three-year goal on that. We are currently migrating our 60,000 item digital collections to a new platform. And once that is completed next spring, we will be applying digital objects for every single special collections item into our archive space instance. And I will have two students working with me on that project. So I definitely recommend, you know, taking advantage of, of the talents of your team um, and the diversity of, of knowledge within your team and finding out what people are good at and the type of work that they like. And we were really lucky to have Anna, who is going to be the next speaker with us. She has since gone off to her PhD program in Kentucky and we really miss her. Um, we're not being here right now, but she was able to work really well with Archive Space and she'll tell you a little bit of her process right now. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Anna. I um, have been a student assistant um, at special collections for two years. And throughout this process of uh, learning archive space, which I knew nothing about before, I've learned, I've been trained on Archon before, but this was completely new to me. Um, so I know some things that worked and some things that didn't work in um, the training process. So hopefully I can share some of this wisdom with you. So if you are going to be preparing training and instruction for your um, student assistants too, I would recommend highly detailed text instructions if you are doing text instructions. So even to the most minuscule details like click X at the top of the right corner and scroll down to and so on, um, even like the most obvious things that might seem so simple to you, uh, might not seem that simple to your student assistant. 
And we all have days when our brains are tired. So um, highly detailed instructions are always a help. If you can add lots of screenshots, that makes the process even easier. And if you can, uh, perhaps um, a video tutorial um, might be um, even more helpful um, so that a student can go back and rewatch a video, remind themselves of a few things that they might have forgotten or just, you know, the brain skipped a little bit. Um, and if you're doing training live uh, via Teams or Zoom, um, that's even better. You can record the video call and that is going to be your video tutorial when you're going through all of the little things that, um, you know, all of the necessary steps. So communication in this process is essential. Uh, for the student assistants who might be listening, communicate clearly with your supervisor. Um, and for the supervisors that are going to be working uh, and instructing student assistants, check on your student assistants. Maybe they are a little bit too shy um, to say that they're having a problem with something. Um, for the student assistants, of course, check if you can solve the problem yourself. Um, but if not, uh, don't wait. Let your supervisor know. It is um, better to solve this problem right now than have it just, you know, sit there and maybe uh, become something bigger. So some of the biggest challenges during this whole process was, of course, work from home. And um, you probably don't need me um, to tell you this, uh, but working from home has been, um, you know, really difficult. And um, all of us, um, you know, had to, you know, switch to this work mode at home. Um, and of course, finding motivation um, can be um, a little bit difficult. Um, consolidation of different work styles from home has also been uh, quite difficult. Uh, when you're working face-to-face, -face, it is uh, so much more, so much easier to just talk it through uh, you can see, you know, the facial expressions. You can understand the mood um, of your coworkers. Um, however, in the um, online environment, that is a little bit hard. And all of us uh, virtually work differently, and we all organize our files a little bit different, and we all create, you know, work documents a little bit different. So putting this all together has been uh, quite a challenge. Returning to past projects. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, to, um, because again, um, some things um, shift priority, some things become uh, more essential at the moment. Uh, sometimes you have to go from one project to the other. Um, and, and sometimes you can forget what you have been doing and um, kind of have to return to it. And, and this is why the video recordings of the training are so essential. So uh, managing projects um, can be a little bit um, difficult, of course, uh, when you're um, you know, tired of working from home, but um, here are some tips and tricks that I've developed for myself. Making a list, of course. Um, having a, you know, a physical list that you write by hand or maybe on your computer so you can keep track of everything that you need to do everything that you might have switched from and then you have to return to um, and having that instant gratification of checking things off the list is very important while working from home. Also trust your feelings. If you're tired from one project, perhaps there is something that has you know, the same amount of priority and you can switch to it. So let your brain rest a little bit so then you can return to it. Uh, with new energy. As for tough projects, of course, there are some things that have the highest priority and they are tough projects and you cannot skip them. Um, set goals for those tough projects. Um, for example, I made tiny goals for myself, like edit five collections. 
or do letters K, L, and M of the spreadsheet, then I would mark them green. And again, that gives your brain that instant gratification. So you can, you know, keep working on the test project a little bit more enthusiastically. Um, taking breaks, of course, is um, essential. Uh, working from home can be difficult. We can uh, forget, you know, to take those breaks. Um, but, you know, even um, standing up from your workspace, uh, grabbing a cup of tea or coffee, um, you know, moving a little bit, again, will give you some extra energy for um, working through those projects. And one of the other um, tips that I found uh, really great for myself is background music. Something that you can, uh, something that can put you in that working mood or create like a bubble around you so that you can really focus um, and on the tough set of this project. And this next picture, if you're not yet familiar with the girl in this picture, um, you should familiarize yourself with her. Um, it, um, if you search on YouTube, lo-fi hip hop music to study to, um, you will find this girl, you will see her. It just, I, I find it the most perfect music uh, to work to, to study to. Um, really uh, put you in the working mood. Um, so yes, highly recommend. Um, some of the skills that I have learned through this whole process. Of course, uh, new skills learning archive say um, should, you know, uh, should be um, very helpful if um, I return to library work um, sometime in the future. Uh, teamwork, especially teamwork, in the remote setting um, makes you um, really uh, just needs flexibility, uh, needs communication, um, and needs um, sometimes, you know, micromanaging for you to keep yourself um, working um, and helping your teammates through the project. Thank you. And I now return it back to Amanda. Thank you so much, Anna, for telling us a little bit about your perspective as a student. Um, just as some final thoughts, um, we went into it with some flexible planning and we were willing to make changes when we needed to. We did some regular review of our process and we prioritized migration time versus cleanup time for our team. Um, and we really invested the time in training our students, uh, especially our students who had already shown that they were planning to stay for a little while. Um, and, and working with our team, we definitely found that that was just, we saved so much time by training our students that it was well worth the investment of training them. Um, and finally, it's not listed here, but we also took great, um, I don't wanna say we took advantage of them, but we, we made great um, partnerships with the team um, who helped us at Archive Space, Madeline Sheldon, Blake Carver, Jessica, um, and it was just so great to work with everybody there. So that helped us out quite a bit, just always being able to contact them. But for us, that's just kind of a rundown of our process and how we did this in a remote setting with the help of students. So we're now ready to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Tomorrow. Um, yeah, we're going to go ahead and move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. So if you have a question or comment that you would like for me to read out loud to the presenters, please do drop it into the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screen, and I'll read that. We don't have any right now, um, but I'm hoping people are typing furiously. Uh, I This was so great. I just want to say thank you. I really enjoyed it. Um, it you made some really great points and gave some really great tips about like planning your migration and documentation, just really great archive space specific workflow suggestions. But you also uh, really highlighted some of the struggles of staying motivated while working from home and just project management in general. So I think that this is this is an excellent presentation and I'm sure that everyone that attended uh, got a little something out of it. Um, I'm definitely going to be uh, searching YouTube for that music to listen to while I'm working. Um, we do have some comments, um, just pointing out an awesome point about learning together and for viewing your documentation as, as living documents, definitely uh, things evolve for sure. Um, uh, really good advice about cycling through different types of work and how to make steady progress through tough projects. I definitely do that myself. You have to give yourself those little wins, like Anna said. 
Uh, and then uh, no questions, but this was a great presentation. Very helpful. Another great presentation. Thanks for sharing. Um, <laughs> perhaps an archive space cleanup Spotify playlist is in order. That actually sounds like a pretty fun project. <laughs> um, so uh, no questions coming in in the chat, but a lot of people agreeing that this was really useful. And I'm, I'm already thinking about um, all the people I'm going to recommend this webinar to because it's been great. Um, any, any um, still waiting for questions to come through or uh, in the chat, but any other last minute thoughts from the panelists? Sure, I just wanted to jump in and, and touch on something Amanda said earlier about um, moving into archive space from Archon, especially for those of us who had been using Archon for a long time. So of our permanent staff, um, at the time Amanda joined us and uh, started working on this project for us, there were three of us uh, in special collections prior to Amanda's joining, and two of us have, had been working with Archon for well over 10 years uh, in various capacities. So oh. having, a, yeah, so it was a really big <laughs> shift for us. And uh, Amanda pointed out very clearly about the, the change in terminology, the nomenclature and things that we had to navigate uh, to, to successfully move into archive space, just kind of from a conceptual level. Um, I, that's a really great time to use the spreadsheets that Amanda showed us and to develop something like that for your own migration, because I think it really helps those of us who, who were having to make that mental shift really focus on, okay, this is what I need to do because this is so different from what I would have done previously in Archon. Or you know, if you could navigate that system with your eyes closed, but you're moving into a new system, it's like just, just really hone in on what those individual steps are to keep you on target and to make sure you um, are able to successfully accomplish your, your goals for cleanup and migration and all of that. So I think, um, I thank you, Amanda, for, for sharing the spreadsheet with everyone. And, and I'm sure uh, Amanda would be willing to you know, help out uh, develop a, a spreadsheet or you know, share the one that she has um, if anyone would be interested in that. Is that is that okay, Amanda? Did I overstep there? <laughs> I'd be totally happy to do that. And I, I definitely called on a lot of colleagues when we were beginning this process. Like I mentioned, I'd be happy to jump onto a Teams or a Zoom call with anyone if you wanted to just kind of talk it through one on one about your institution's individual needs if you're thinking about making this jump or if you've recently made it and you're thinking about training. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, and we'll make sure that um, if we'll make sure that a copy of the slides are included with the recording if if you maybe want to make any of your documentation or anything available there so that people aren't um, emailing you um, over and over asking for examples we can definitely put it uh, that documentation with the recording to try to save some time there um, we are getting some questions um, and sort of to to this point there's a question regarding your workflows and timelines what sort of softwares did you use for your project management so we chose to keep it simple and use Box Online, um, and we used Excel within Box Online to make sure that everyone could have synchronous editing. Because my spreadsheet, you couldn't see it in the screenshot, but there were probably about 15 tabs on it. And once we got to clean up, each staff person had their own tab for their collections. Uh, so our Florida archivist had all the Florida collections that I parsed out on his own column. And I just had to make sure that everyone knew to please do your editing within the web platform. Don't download the Excel, work on it, and then re-upload it or do anything like that because it might cut out other people working. We often had three to four, our students always seem to work on the same shifts because of class schedules. And so the students would be working simultaneously. And so it was just the easiest way for us to kind of manage that was in just a, a living Excel document that could be synchronously edited. Um, it didn't require us to go out and get any third party uh, paid project management software for it either. And all the students had free access. Yeah, free is always great. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, another question uh, in the Q&A, um, for your migration, did you use any of the spreadsheet importers like the, the load via spreadsheet tool in Archive Space? 
our spreadsheet, uh, or sorry, our um, migration was done completely using XML that was harvested out of Archon. So once we had finished updating everything and had all of it uh, pushed to publish um, by our systems administrator, he just went ahead and exported the entirety of Archon records as XML, and then the whole thing was uploaded as XML. We haven't done a lot of cleaning with batch. Um, the batch revised tools within Archon yet. I've used it somewhat and it's really helpful to use. Um, but so far we've been doing uh, kind of more like entire collection cleanups. And so we haven't used too much of like the batch revised for the item levels yet. Um, there's another comment. This has been very helpful for both myself and my intern. <laughs> Very happy to hear that. I love giving students projects. Let's see if it's fun. <laughs> all right, looks like we're all caught up in the chat. Um, I'm going to speak really slowly. So if anyone is typing any last minute questions, please go ahead and do that now. But again, thank you so much to um, Amanda, Tamaro, and Anna for uh, this presentation. It's It's been great. It's been super useful. The recording will be available on our website soon. And again, thank you so much for being flexible uh, and rescheduling this. Um, I know that we anticipated doing this a long time ago, so I'm glad we were finally able to make it happen. Uh, and uh, thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, I know you hadn't initially planned on attending this on this day, so I'm glad for those of you that were able to, to come and those of you that joined us after the, the scheduling changed. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you at the next Archive Space webinar. Thanks, everybody. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.